Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. If you can hear me, please type in our um, comment section or our chat panel wherever you are in Facebook Live or in YouTube Live. Um, please tell us where you are coming from so that we all we are also aware from which locations are our participants coming from. So we are reading comments. We, we have some participants coming from Tacloban, Leyte. We also have from Davao. We also have from Cebu. All right, good to know that you are here. How about the others? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you. May I know our other participants? Where are you coming from? So that you will also be recognized now. Um, our start of Thursday's uh, episode this afternoon is our second of our four part Start Up Thursday's webinar series for the whole month of June. So to our Suki na. Uh, viewers, welcome back. And for those who um, just joined us today, uh, we welcome you to our Startup Thursday's webinar series. This is our second uh, webinar for our Startup Thursday's webinar series. But nevertheless, if you just came in today, you're still welcome. And you can also share to our um, to your friends, to your relatives, to anyone uh, you know, to your colleagues, no, who want to know and who want to um, learn about um, startups, no. We have a very good topic for today. Let me just check my YouTube because I believe there is some sort of um, feed back happening let me fix it for a while All right, how about that one? Is our um, audio in YouTube okay now? Please confirm our dear participants no? so that we know if uh, we are good to go. All right. So we, we also have participants coming in from Biliran province. We also have uh, from Ilocos Norte. All right. So we also have from Ormoc. We have from Tugigarao, Cagayan Valley. Then we also have from Tacloban. It's good to know, no? It's good to know that you are joining us today. Um, wherever you come from, from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, I believe um, our major island groups are well represented. But before anything else, allow me to um, present to you or tell you our webinar house rules no? so that we are guided um, to our um, webinar for this afternoon, especially on how you can claim your certificates. Because we have certificates to uh, give, no? to dole out after this webinar. So if you have questions, um, we have a Q&A part. Uh, later, no, at the end of this webinar, which our speaker will be glad to answer. So you may drop your questions at the live chat panel or you may um, you may also, if, if we are friends, you can also directly send me no, a message, a private message. Um, if you are shy to uh, comment in your questions, so... Um, you may, of course, um, drop your questions at our comment section or our live chat panel. They may be picked 
and be answered by our speaker during the live discussion. He may actually answer now while he is presenting. Although we have already um, allotted um, a special time later at the end for the Q&A um, portion later. Now to ensure participation, a code of the day or COTD will be flashed anytime during the webinar. So the COTD, our code of the day, must be entered in the evaluation form um, for you to be able to submit the form. All right, there is a part there. There is a field in our evaluation form asking for the COTD. So you have to input the COTD, no? Um, this is, of course, to ensure participation that you really are listening and you are watching. So anytime during our webinar, it will be flashed. So you have to take note of that COTD, all right? So the link to the evaluation form will be given at the end of the webinar. So no evaluation form, no digital certificate. So once again, you have, of course, to answer an, an evaluation form um, for you to receive your digital certificate. So um, the evaluation form allows us know uh, on, on which areas we must improve, and we would also know what are the topics that you want, no, that you have in mind so that we can um, conduct another webinar about that topic. So your answers will be very much appreciated. So the form uh, will only be available within 30 minutes after the link is given. So say, for example, we end at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Um, so you only have until 4.30, no? because there's only 30 minutes um, given for you to answer because it will close after 30 minutes. Now, digital certificates will be given within one week after this webinar. And um, enjoy the webinar. We have a very good topic this afternoon and we really have a very good uh, bigatin na speaker no? um, for this afternoon. So uh, you enjoy and if you have questions, this is um, an opportunity for us, no, um, for our thoughts to be clarified, or if if you are planning to establish a startup, no, we can get um, we can get some pieces of advice coming from our um, speaker who is also a startup founder himself. So we learn it from the expert for this afternoon. All right, so we we have a lot of announcements. Um, and we do, or we, we announce our announcements through our Facebook page. So we hope and we look forward for you to like no? and following our um, Facebook page. That's at the ICTFOO VC2. No? For you to get updated with other webinars and for other announcements that we do, then please like and follow. Now, So for those who attended our first webinar in our Startup Thursdays webinar series, um, your certificates are actually already uh, already ready. Um, you, we sent an email um, a day ago on how you can um, how you can download your certificate for our Startup Thursdays um, episode one last. Um, June, June 3. If in case you did not receive any email, it might be on the spam folder, no? Or um, you you might have input a wrong email, no? Baka may typo yung email address na binigay nyo. So you can still download your certificate for those who attended our first part through this link, no? That's bit.ly slash st1 certs, right? Once again, for those who did not receive any email, uh, we, we sent an email the other day um, informing you and providing you instructions on how you can get your certificate. So if you did not receive any, you can um, visit this link, the one you see on our screen. No? Um, to, um, for you to download. So um just a reminder for everyone now if you if you um if you think our video is on low quality mode no parang hindi siya 
um, high definition, you might want to check your settings, no? Kasi baka naka, ang resolution niya naka 144 or lower, then you might want to increase perhaps 720, no? You can actually adjust your screen resolution para mas, ano, mas HD feels, no? Ang ating um, panonood ngayong hapon. Alright? So before we begin, allow me to uh, provide our demographics now for those who registered. Um, who are we expecting for this afternoon? So um, most of our participants this afternoon are actually males. No? There's 57 or almost 60% of our participants this afternoon are male. So male dominated. No? Bakit kaya? Usually in our previous webinars, our... Um, Participants are always uh, palagi nadada, nadadaig ng female, ang mga male. But this time, mas madami ang males. Bakit kaya? Perhaps uh, males are more into startups? Is that it kaya? Who knows? <laughs> but nevertheless, we have a 40% um, of females of you um, who registered to our webinar this afternoon. And most of our um, participants are actually students. No? There's around more than 20% of our um, participants who registered for this afternoon are actually students. Then we also have teachers no? coming in at second place with 12%. And we appreciate that no? that we have teachers for this afternoon, um, especially that once you go back to your classes, no? you can share something to your students no? about technopreneurship. Our speaker this afternoon is also um, a teacher. He also teaches, no? So we also have a good number of online freelancers. We have unemployed, perhaps, uh, yung mga na-displaced natin, no? Unfortunately, displaced na mga um, workers and OFWs, perhaps. You might want to um, establish your own startup, no? So this is a very good time. This is an opportune time for us to learn, no? coming from the expert about um, startups, All right? So what else do we have here? Our youngest participant who registered is at 19 years old, while our oldest is at 65 years old, while the average um, participant's age that we have is from 29 to 35 years old. All right, and our Major island groups are well represented. We have um, registrants coming from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So let, let me check from our comment section, no? um, what are the locations or where are our participants coming in? So we have from Shaton, Negros Oriental. We have from Calbayog City. So we also have from Iloilo, from Occidental Mindoro. We also have from Western Visayas, from Antique. All right, so we also have um, from Ilocos Norte, no? from Luzon. So we really appreciate you for coming and joining us uh, this afternoon. So without further ado, um, allow me um, to call our um, DICT Visayas Cluster 2's focal for the ICT Industry Development Bureau, no? who is actually the host or who is in charge for our Startup Thursday's webinar series for the whole month of June. So may I call in our ever beautiful and ever supportive uh, Miss Claire Fernandez for the opening message. Go ahead, Miss Claire. Thank you so much, Josh. No, of course, Josh is our Pambansang IT guy, the one and only. No? I mean, it's a really great honor to be here with you, especially sa mga students. No? You are so blessed. Sa time na po, Wag mo nakita nung kailan ako nag-graduate ng college. Wala pa mga startup, mga ganito. Na. But now, especially during this pandemic, nagiging isa itong focus ng DICT. So once again, good afternoon everyone. Um, here from the city of Tacloban, we call it Maupay na Kulog pa iyong atanan. So we are so blessed to have, of course, no, uh, Doc Jomar because Peta ka, di ba? They focus on cashless payments using blockchain technology. They are Eastern Visayas 
first locally developed financial technology application or fintech app diba sila pinakauna so everyone know we are so blessed to have this from ours our very own i mean no from our here in region 8 no sa eastern visayas um, the ICT you know, has been very supportive to startup, especially to foster the growth of the startup and innovation ecosystem. We have the Philippine Startup Challenge, the Philippine uh, Roadmap for Digital Startups, and of course, right now we have this uh, Startup Thursdays, no, diba? every Thursday for the month of June. So I'm really very happy to have every one of you here. No? Um, here in the Philippines, there are almost 2,000 startups and we are very blessed to have one of the best, especially here in Region 8. So, hindi ko nahabain, no? I'm sure you're very excited no, to have this uh, ating Startup Thursday. So, I'll just get back to you, Josh. And once again, good afternoon sa ating lahat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Claire, for opening and welcoming our participants. Now, I know they are very eager to listen and even I myself am very excited to hear it once again from our very bigatin na speaker for this afternoon. <laughs> Speaking of speaker, allow me to introduce also our speaker this afternoon. Um, Dr. Jomar is the founder, uh, president, and CEO of Paytaka, a payment wallet app and ecosystem of e-payments enabled services. So he finished um, BS Biology from the University of the Philippines in the Visayas in Tacloban City and earned his Master of Science in Biology from UP Diliman. Yeah, and so as what I've said, bigatin talaga ang ating speaker for this afternoon. He earned his Doctor in Bioengineering Sciences and Doctor of Science in Biotechnology in no less than abroad <laughs> so Belgium in two different universities, no? And so please help me welcome with your virtual round of applause our bigatina speaker for this afternoon. It's my second time listening to him, um, Dr. Jomar Tagana. So Dr. Jomar, please take it away. The floor and microphone is yours. Hello, thank you. Um, does anybody, everybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh -huh. Sir Jomar. Good. Uh, all right. Thank you for that warm welcome, Joshua and Claire and George. Thank you for having me in this uh, Startup Thursdays. I'm glad that our uh, government through DICT is strengthening its uh, support uh, having these kinds of programs in order to encourage people to at least learn about how startups work and maybe at some point if you have the right skills and uh, you have the motivation you can start your own from starting from whatever innovative products you have you may uh, come up with Okay, um, let me share my slides. Let me share my internet. Okay, I guess you see that. You see my screen? Okay. Yes, sir, Jomar. All right, so today I'll be uh, sharing to you about um, blockchain cryptocurrencies and decentralized commerce so lots of lots of startups all over the world are jumping into uh, uh, blockchain being one of the uh, hot technologies uh, one of the technologies that has transformed a lot of industries already since it has uh, it was uh, invented in back in 2008 okay um i was already introduced so i'm jomar you can call me jomar sir jomar whatever and um i'm the founder and ceo of paytaka so paytaka is a financial technology startup i'll i'll connect to my presentation about towards the end uh, about where Paytaka fits in this um, 
blockchain uh, revolution uh, what, what we think we can do in order to advance blockchain technology and uh, make the world better for everyone somehow okay okay um let's dive into this um, i know you are many of you are interested to know about blockchain um let's start with uh one particular event, a very humble event, um, 31st of August 2008, somebody who went by the uh, pseudonym uh, Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper uh, entitled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So this was uh, like a boring day, probably, uh, but um, the, it, it was also a very short paper. And if you read the, the, the paper itself, it may be too technical for non-programmers, non-mathematicians. But in this humble paper, um, Satoshi Nakamoto proposed a system that has revolutionized um many industries uh, since the publishing publication of this uh, paper and um in order to appreciate how how revolutionary the idea is we need to uh, step back and uh, view it, view it in a particular in a historical context I don't intend to explain the technical details in this talk. I don't think we have enough time for that today. But um, what I hope I can achieve is to somehow provide you with an overview, um, yeah, as I've said, historical background in order to appreciate why this is such uh, like a, one of the leaps in, in mankind, like comparable to the invention of the internet or the invention of the printing press or the discovery of electricity. So how come or why, why is the Bitcoin and the underlying technology, blockchain technology, why is it considered such a revolutionary uh, invention? So in order, okay, let's, let's start with uh, what we understand about commerce. Because um, if you notice, the introduction here of Satoshi's paper starts with the statement that commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties. So if you, if you go through reading the introduction, he is talking about um, uh, a weakness of the current internet, or at least the internet during his time, to support payments that he thinks are uh, safe and free from uh, potential hacks and potential uh, attempts to tamper, uh, like financial records. So he was working within that background that he thinks that somehow the internet, the commerce in commerce in the internet is broken. Something has to be done about it. And later on, you will realize why he thinks it's broken and what's what his solution solution is. And a little bit, uh, maybe I'll try a little bit to explain how it works. But I'm not hoping that by the end of this talk, you suddenly become blockchain experts. But at least I could try. Um, okay, so commerce is um, at the very basic, it's defined as exchange of goods or services. So when you exchange, for example, like like in the like thousands of years ago, people exchange rice for fish, it's considered uh, commerce. Uh, but these days, we, we don't do such uh, direct trade, we use a certain um, medium of exchange, which we are more familiar is called 
money. So um, commerce these days is done through a medium, uh, medium of exchange, which we call money. So, oh yeah, I have this slide. So the um, commerce in the beginning, like really beginning of human civilization, Stone Age, for example, they were doing uh, an, a, a system of trading called barter. So somebody, for example, that has fish, exchanges uh, with rabbit. So just like in this figure. And um, you see the, this this kind of exchange depends on certain uh, coincidences to happen. Like for example, this fisherman um, who happens to uh, want to eat some rabbit for dinner and he has fish. So in order to uh, have a successful trade, he has to find a person who has a rabbit and is interested to have fish in exchange. So these two coincidences has to happen. So you can imagine if you live in such age, the Stone Age or the, uh, yeah, during those days, thousands of years ago, it would have been very difficult to do commerce or exchange. And also, um, as you can see, for example, this guy who has rabbit might say, um, hmm, your, your fish is re not really equivalent to one rabbit. But they, they don't have a way to like cut the rabbit half because they don't have refrigerators that time. They will not uh, benefit from half a rabbit. So the accounting of values is, is very difficult. So it's a whole rabbit or nothing. So the other cartoon here shows why money was invented. It's because of the difficulties in doing barter trade. So later on, uh, humans learned how to do exchange in a more efficient way, and that is uh, using money. And I already mentioned one of the functions of money is as a medium of exchange, meaning that instead of directly exchanging commodities among among each other, um, we use a certain medium, which is money. At that time, um, especially during the Iron Age, Metal Age, uh, when people discovered how to extract metal from the earth, they were using gold, silver, bronze as a medium of exchange. And um, if you have if you have something used as a medium of exchange, uh, you can later on earn a lot of it. So, for example, you work for you work in a farm, you earn gold because that was the medium of exchange at that time. You can work straight for five days, two weeks, one month, and you can store whatever you earned from that. Uh, because you can actually store gold and that will serve like uh, maybe for rainy days. So it, it serves another function of money, which is uh, it is for a store of value. And also uh, another function of money is that you can now like compare um, the relative value of different goods. For example, uh, Let's say let's say the medium of exchange is not gold but rice, which which actually was used as a medium of exchange in some Asian uh, communities before. So, for example, you work for a day, you get one bucket of rice, and you work for two days, you get two buckets of rice. So, there is you are able to establish some uh, units of value. And for example, you earn one bucket of rice because you work for one day, you can use to buy milk, you can use the rice you earn to buy milk, and that milk costs half a bucket of rice. So you can imagine that uh, after centuries of using this system, uh, medium of exchange, having this kind of money, 
being used as medium of exchange, um, it became more and more convenient for people to, to do trade, to do commerce. And later on, when uh, somebody invented utang, uh, money was also very useful as an instrument for paying back. So you, you lend, uh, you borrow rather money from your employer, for example, and then you you pay that with money later on, and that's that's possible because we have uh, money, and these are these are things that you usually take for granted because uh, we use money every day. We we don't think about how money works and what it means. We just know that it works. But um, with the blockchain revolution, with the with the, the start of the paper of Satoshi Nakamoto. We, it puts into question about uh, why, why are we using certain uh, objects or commodities as, as money? So if you illustrate the, the evolution of money, it will be like, as I mentioned, started with barter. And at some point, people used gold. And then... Um, Later on, metal was becoming more precious, so uh, kingdoms or governments started issuing coins instead of gold bars or some gold bullions. And then, um, as metal is becoming more rare also, it's being used in other industries, um, what, what people would usually do before they deposit their gold coins or their metal coins in a bank and they get a paper to certify that they have this much gold in the bank. And later on, um, this paper became like a proof that you have, you have some money somewhere and uh, governments like uh, like in China, in at a certain point in China, they started using paper money uh, instead of of metal coins or gold. And in the 1940s, um, when electronics was already uh, like widespread, the internet at that time was still being researched. Um, some banks uh, introduced the concept of credit cards. So instead of bringing paper money, you have a plastic card you can present to the restaurants. And then the restaurants uh, communicate with the bank that here is Mr. Juan de la Cruz um, wants to pay for his food using credit card. And so the bank will just debit the that amount to be paid from his credit card balance. Okay, that's, that was around 1940s and uh, 19, 1990s when the, during the advent of the internet, um, we have what we now know as electronic uh, money um, was, was uh, invented as well. And um, we are mostly dominated now by electronic money. So we still, we still use paper money, plastic cards, for example. But the way we usually shop online is we are using some form of electronic money, either through online banking or through your uh, mobile wallet apps. All of them fall under this uh, category of uh, under this stage of evolution uh, of money. Okay, and um, as I mentioned, uh, around 2008, um, the concept of cryptocurrency was uh, born, was uh, prototyped, and um, it suddenly became a hot topic. It, it puts into question whether we, whether we should upgrade our uh, money system, financial system, in order to uh, use cryptocurrencies. And that, that transition is still uh, happening before our eyes. And um, 
it's good to like at least appreciate why um, we think that cryptocurrency would be a not just a counterpart to the current electronic money systems, but maybe even a better replacement. So what would it mean actually if um, we switch to a cryptocurrency, at least for some part of our commercial activity, um, not necessarily everything that we need money for, but like slowly um, using cryptocurrency uh, for whatever it is designed. So originally um, on the paper published by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, what he had in mind was to use Bitcoin, which is the first cryptocurrency, uh, as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, meaning that um, unlike other money uh, monetary systems bitcoin is actually um, designed so that every holder of the coin has the key to spend it and nobody nobody uh, nobody else as long as you you hold your key to your to your bitcoins nobody else can spend it that's why it's a uh, it's that's one of the reasons why it's considered peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash, and that's uh, that's uh, in contrast to electronic money, uh, where somebody else is holding the spending power. So they they can actually somebody like a hacker of the bank or a hacker of the credit card system, they can go into the ledger. Uh, that's somewhere in the servers uh, controlled by the banks. Um, they can change the records of your balance. Like instead of you having one million in your card or in your bank account, um, they can maybe slash it to 500,000 and then 500,000 is sent to them. And that can happen and it happens a lot. There's a lot of losses due to theft, uh, online theft uh, in, in uh, electronic uh, money systems. And, and, and it is something that um, cryptocurrency is trying to address. Okay, um, here I have shown the, the amount of centralization or the scale of centralization in a color scale. So, what we mean by centralization is the uh, control of the of the money, like in terms of uh, being ability to spend it, or ability to devalue the money, or like ability to reuse the money for other purposes. So towards the left side, it's green means. Um, it's decentralized, it's more decentralized. And towards the red, the right side means it's more centralized. So actually the, the barter trade system is green, it's decentralized. Meaning once you have the fish that you, that you caught from the sea, you have it. Nobody else has control about how, how your fish will be spent because you have that in your hands. The same for gold. So these are more or, more or less decentralized money systems. Um, for metal coins, the, the government to issue the metal coins can, for example, go broke. And at some point, your metal coin will be worthless. For example, the kingdom that issued the coin was invaded by another kingdom. Then suddenly, your the metal coins that bear the maybe the image of the previous king suddenly becomes almost useless. So that's why it's represented here as uh, somewhat decentralized because anyway, if you have the coins, you have ultimate control about how you spend it. But then it's dependent on an, the value of it is dependent on uh, 
on the government or the kingdom. It's the same for paper money, but uh, it's even yeah. What makes paper money more centralized is that um, at least the way it works in the banks, um, when you deposit your money, like in your savings account, um, actually the bank is not required to keep all your deposit, all your deposits ready for withdrawal. So it's called the fractional reserve system. So the bank is allowed to use a significant part of your deposits and lend it to other people. That's how the banking system works. So you think you have 1 million, you deposited 1 million to a bank and you think you can withdraw that anytime. In theory, um, it's allowed, but normally uh, not, especially if you try to withdraw uh, a big amount of money. And anyway, in practice, not so many people are, or many people are just depositing it for many months and there, the banks are actually allowed to uh, use your savings and invest it in other things. And if that is mismanaged somehow, the bank invested it in some, in some companies that uh, went broke, then um, you lost your money, basically. And that's why when you, if you noticed, when you deposit to certain banks, they would only say that your deposit is only insured up to 500,000 pesos by the PDIC. So it's quite risky to deposit more than 500,000 pesos because when the banks go broke, they cannot refund you the money. They can, they can declare for bankruptcy. Okay. So this makes paper money and also actually plastic cards uh, a bit more, more centralized in that sense compared to gold or metal coins. And um, the the current evolution of money, which is electronic money, is, I would say, uh, the most centralized of all the money systems we have invented. Um, that's why um, it's rather easy, or, well, not very easy, but you need special technical skills to, to hack financial systems that use electronic money. And... Um, we're not just even talking about external hackers, even like the employees, disgruntled employees of whatever bank or credit card issuers, they can go into the server and alter the balances there. So uh, get one million from you, put it on his uh, side of the ledger, on his balance. And um, I would say this is the the most centralized and also quite risky form of money um, that's uh, ever uh, devised. And um, Satoshi Nakamoto is right that um, we shouldn't be building our the future of internet on this kind of money, which is prone to tampering. So that's just what I explained, uh, plastic cards, and electronic money. This is how it works. Um, Lucy tries to send Bob uh, $10. So it goes through a centralized system, a bank or a financial institution. It's like asking the financial institution to change the records because we are not holding any, any coins anymore. We don't have paper money. Your money now, if you do online banking or you transfer things from your mobile wallet, is basically just a record in a very big spreadsheet that resides somewhere in the servers of the bank. So essentially, when you are sending $10 to somebody, like for Lucy trying to send $10 to Bob or 10 pesos, whatever, you are just asking basically the bank to, hey, update my balance 
deduct 10 pesos from my balance and then add that 10 pesos to Bob. And same same thing for other transactions. So John trying to transfer $40 to Julie. The, the bank is just essentially deducting $40, $40 from John and adding $40 to Julie. And we have to trust the keyword is trust. So we trust that the bank that the, that the bank will will do the changes accurately. Like they are not. We are trust. We trust that the banks will 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 not tamper with the balances. But anything that can go wrong will go wrong according to Murphy's law. So this kind of system, a trust based ledger to manage our money is the problem uh, is the the thing that satoshi nakamoto thinks is broken something has to be done about this otherwise um, we will forever be uh, subject to like uh, at the mercy of somebody who might mess up with the ledger and we cannot do anything about it so how do we solve this problem? If we try, if we try, imagine that you are tasked to solve this problem now. Um, well, anyway, let's jump into how how Satoshi Nakamoto proposed to to solve this problem. Basically, the 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 problem can be stated in multiple ways. So. It's the problem can be stated as um, we have a problem about potential tampering of the ledger that somebody might not record uh, the debits and credits accurately. Or it can also be expressed that in, in such a way that um, in the context of uh, spending your balance twice or three times. In other words, um, for example, Lucy has a collusion with the bank. He keeps transferring, uh, he keeps paying in shops uh, 100 pesos, but the bank is not recording the, the debits. So if Lucy has 1 million in the bank and he has collusion with somebody in the bank, he can keep spending that 1 million without his balance, her balance rather, being uh, affected. So she's able to double spend uh, or spend multiple times uh, the balance that he ha she has. Okay, so how does Bitcoin uh, solve this? So um, in, in, a, in a simple description, what Bitcoin does is distribute this ledger so so when you request for basically a, a transfer transaction you're requesting that the ledger be be changed so that um, you deduct something from me because I'm sending some Bitcoin and you add some Bitcoin on somebody else's balance on, on the recipient's uh, record and just like in the bank you transmit this to the network but in this case the centralized system here, which used to be just one entity having control on the ledger, in a blockchain, in the blockchain, in Bitcoin, there are multiple computers. In practice, there are like hundreds of thousands of computers um, that are taking this, that transaction and each of them are checking if by the each of them each of these nodes of com or computers uh have a has a copy of of the complete ledger so it's actually just like a sophisticated voting process so the nodes who will receive the transaction will vote so they vote they say oh okay this is valid according to my copy of the ledger uh Alice has enough balance to spend 
uh, to send to Bob. And then uh, when they agree, they coordinate a change in the ledger, like synchronized harmonious change of everyone's record, like in the hundreds of thousands of computers that participate in this network. So if, for example, uh, one of these computer has a collusion with Alice, it's okay because there are hundreds, hundreds of thousands more computers who are honest that will keep the ledger accurate. So this transaction, once validated, they are um, organized into groups, groups of transactions uh, called blocks. And these blocks are uh, added to, to, to a chain. So there's a chain of blocks that goes back to the very, very first block uh, created by Satoshi Nakamoto himself. Uh, this is in, in sequential order. So this, the, the latest block is put into the uh, chain. So it, it forms a, a chain of blocks of transactions. That's why it's called a blockchain. Okay. So these participating computers are doing that because you might be wondering why would these computers participate in validating these transactions? What do they gain from it? Why, why, would, you, why would you want to do it? So um, Satoshi Nakamoto designed an incentive system for anybody who has a computer to participate in this network. So you might have a gaming computer there, you might use, you might want to use to, to participate in validate transactions. And if you're lucky, um, you, you might be able to assemble one of the blocks that will be added to the blockchain you are rewarded uh, 10 Bitcoins. Um, is it still, I'm not sure if it's still 10 Bitcoins now, but um, at some point it was 10 Bitcoins per block. Uh, if, your, if your computer is able to assemble this block that eventually get incorporated into the blockchain. So if you are a computer who participate in this, you have the incentive to validate transactions correctly. So why would you lie? You're just spending electricity. So if you participate in this network, you might as well just validate correctly and then have a chance to, to win 10 Bitcoins. But, but this, this, this process is called mining, by the way. And uh, this is a very competitive uh, industry now. And um, in order to have a chance to assemble a block, you you need to invest in some really powerful computers. Um, these days, but in the earlier days, like in the early days of Bitcoin, it was more possible to just mine using your ordinary laptop. Okay, so we, we missed that opportunity already. Anyway, um, so that's how the blockchain is able to keep uh, the ledger intact and protect it from uh, tampering. So in other words, um, we, we are bypassing the bank if, when, when we are using Bitcoin because it's, it's a new currency in itself. It's a new form of money that runs on its own computer network. And that computer network keeps a synchronized ledger that, that is practically uh, immune to tampering. You cannot alter any record in it. And um, that, that solves the, the, the double spending problem or our problem about potential tampering of uh, ledgers that these financial institutions are using. Okay. Are there 
Any questions at this point? Okay. Um, after the introduction of Bitcoin and uh, it became wildly popular since its introduction in 2008, um, people realized that this can actually be used in other industries. So not just in payments. Of course, if you have a currency that runs on this kind of infrastructure, it would be good for payments, for remittance, for e-commerce, everything that involves money uh, would uh, benefit from this uh, anti-tampering property of, of, of the blockchain uh, or of the cryptocurrencies that are, that are created in these blockchains. But later on, there were variations to the Bitcoin blockchain. So now there are many other blockchain projects like Ethereum, uh, Cardano, Polkadot. And um, some of these blockchains are designed to run uh, more complicated logic that can be used to implement smart contracts. So these are like, these are like contracts in the legal sense of the word, but in, in programs, programmed contracts. So there are many such use cases for also for commerce, but, but also for um, uh, stamping like notarization or escrow, etc. There are many other industries that will benefit from the use of blockchain, the underlying technology that powers Bitcoin. Um, and um, I just couldn't exhaust all the um, explanation on why, for example, blockchain will be useful in any of these markets. Um, but suffice it to know that at this point, blockchain is being used to disrupt existing industries. And this is a uh, uh, this presents uh, uh, lots of opportunities for people who have ideas or who can appreciate how the blockchain works and can build some applications on top of it in order to um, disrupt uh, current industries that might benefit from the properties that I just described to you earlier. Okay, um, I'll switch gears into uh, telling you about why um, Bitcoin, after all these years, since 2008, why are we not using Bitcoin for payments yet? So it's not widespread, so any new technology will take some time to, to become uh, commonly used in, in, in everyday uh, situations. But there are some unique circumstances in the history of Bitcoin that uh, slowed down its adoption um, according to the original intentions of Satoshi Nakamoto. So um, Satoshi originally intended Bitcoin to be used as a currency, another form of money that can be used for commerce in, in the internet. But at some point in its history, Bitcoin became a victim of its own success because since its launch in 2008, um, it became very popular that the number of transactions per day being done on the network increased to like 100,000 or 110,000 by around 2015. So imagine 110,000 transactions a day. That's, that is even a tiny fraction compared to Visa or MasterCard. But then um, the developers, the maintainers of the software, already noticed that Bitcoin is slowing down and um, the transaction fee 
uh, was uh, skyrocketing because you have to pay a small transaction fee initially that was small when when Bitcoin was not popular yet. But when it reached a certain level of popularity, the network became congested. It became um, expensive to move Bitcoins around. And so in around 2017, there was a, like a political divide between the between two camps in the Bitcoin community. So people who still want to use Bitcoin for peer-to-peer -peer payments and people who want to just allow it to stay like it is, like high fees, slow, uh, but will be used instead as a store of value, as a replacement for gold. So not, not really about being able to uh, be used as payments, but uh, like a collectible, as a, a store of value, uh, as a replacement for gold. So these two camps, um, the, the politics and uh, at that time cost uh, split between uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. So Bitcoin, there were so this camp here who want to keep using to, to, to go to pursue the path of using Bitcoin for digital store of value. They were able to keep the name Bitcoin and the ticker BTC. So the people who would rather see the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto happen, they introduce improvements into the network in order to improve its speed and to keep the fees low so that it can still fulfill the mission of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. It became known as this, this branch or this version became known as Bitcoin Cash. So Paytaka, this is, this is where uh, our startup company connects because I myself, I'm a believer of uh, Bitcoin as a payment system. I think the concept is, is revolutionary. I think we should be able to get uh, to replace um, electronic cash systems with a cryptocurrency. It could be Bitcoin or something else, but a better version of money that is more suited for the internet. And um, because of this split where Bitcoin Cash wants to focus on the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash concept, naturally, uh, we'd like to align with this, with this goal and we are using Bitcoin Cash uh, you'd like to build on top of Bitcoin Cash in order to make it more accessible to everyone, everywhere, by, by designing or by building a wallet for one, uh, wallets that can be used for payments online or offline. So that's one of the, uh, one of the innovations that we're introducing in Paytaka is that um, Part of our mission to see like Bitcoin Cash being used for payments everywhere in every country by everyone. So we we worked on uh, building a, a wallet, a mobile wallet app that will work even if there's no internet connection. So because one of the things that hinder the usage of mobile wallet apps is that you need internet connection in order to transact. Yeah. So, you know, the, the current state of internet in the Philippines, and it's not just in the Philippines, but also in many uh, developing countries in Africa, for example, where they have this problem. Automatically, they will be excluded from this revolutionary new monetary system. But that's one thing that we are trying to solve in Paytaka. We want to make cryptocurrency in the form of Bitcoin Cash available to everyone, everywhere, with or without internet connection. And my 
my talk ends there. Thank you for listening and appreciate your questions. All right. Uh, can you hear me, Sir Dr. Jomar? Yeah. All right. So we we actually have um, around 130 viewers no in our Facebook Live while while almost 50 viewers in YouTube no and they have um, some questions um, that they have thrown. I hope you can answer them. <laughs> this is an opportunity no. Um, for, for the others who are also watching, um, you can still throw your questions no, while we are doing the Q&A. So here goes the first um, question, Sir Jomar. Um, so given, given that we have seen the evolution of money, um, as you have presented no, from barter to plastic cards and electronic money, so what do you think is the future of our money? Is is cryptocurrency already the ultimate form or are we already living to the future of money? What do you think, uh, Dr. Jomar? Uh, interesting question. Um, like cryptocurrency is barely even realized yet. Like uh, as I've uh, mentioned, um, we're not there yet. We, we still are in the works in terms of uh, making cryptocurrency available to everybody and making it available for payments. So it's, uh, hmm, what would be the future of payments beyond cryptocurrency? That's an interesting question. I'm also curious about what the answer is. Uh, maybe telepathic payments? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Wireless payments? <laughs> yeah, wireless, like contactless, literally, without fingers. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, again, it's it's very difficult to visualize at this point. Um, we are more focused on uh, making cryptocurrencies happen because it's not, it's not yet happening. Uh, most of the uses of cryptocurrencies now, people buy cryptocurrencies because they hope that it will increase in value at some point and uh, that's not the original intention at all of creating cryptocurrencies it's it's supposed to address the weakness of our current electronic cash system and uh, the future of the internet rests on having a robust and safe and uh, anonymous payment system that that that, that will be uh, not not subject to uh, how do you call this government control uh, censorship for example all right i see yeah. so we we actually have here um, a comment no coming from lutrine in youtube I, i'm not sure if he he or she is coming from the philippines but he um commented that what a clever name Paytaka. No, maybe you can share to us, Dr. Jomar, what is the story behind um, the coining of the uh, name Pitaka? Okay. Um, it came from the word Pitaka. So, yeah, if you speak Filipino, I don't know if you, if the the person who asked is speaks Filipino. So, Pitaka is a. Uh, so it's used in Tagalog and, and Waray Waray as well, I think in, in Bisaya. Yeah? Bisaya, Bitaka, yes. Yeah. It's a universal Filipino language, a Filipino term. Pitaka means wallet or purse. So it's just a play on that word um, because we're trying trying to create a payment system. Um, payment, rather a payment wallet app uh, to, be, to be more specific. So we just transformed Pitaka to... Pay taka. Mm -hmm, yeah. So what a clever, <laughs> what a clever mm -hmm. use, no, of of the term. But anyways, we have a question, another question from Gypsy Doctor uh, Joe Mar. Maybe maybe you know you know some answers for his uh, his or her question, no? Are there any guidelines or policies issued by BSP uh, with regard to cryptocurrencies? Mm -hmm. Um. There are some circulars, uh, recent ones, like a few months back, um, issued by the BSP about um, companies that want to, uh, uh, what do you call this, provide 
services uh, relating to cryptocurrencies like included there is like if you want to create an exchange your company and you want to create an exchange for cryptocurrencies you want to use it for to facilitate payments so uh bsp uh lumps these companies together into another category what they call as uh, virtual asset service provider uh as opposed to like uh previous categorizations like before the circular if you want to build a company that deals about payments you would likely be categorized as a money license transmitter a money 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 transmitter uh, business rather or an e-money issuer company which had like uh, a different set of regulations that's uh, that's very strict but for companies like Paytaka who want to offer like uh, virtual asset service um, we fall on that uh, new category which is I would say it's a it's a it's a good gesture from the BSP to welcome innovations in the financial technology space and um, I think that's a good uh, way to approach so instead of of uh, like discouraging innovation and new technologies in this space they actually encourage it and that's a that's a good development favorable for Paytaka. all right so uh, marty from youtube uh sir jomar would like to clarify if Paytaka is like um a fintech um, app just like gcash or paymaya or are there similarities or differences um there are some overlaps so uh, in the end what will what people will experience uh, from 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 the products that we develop is mainly the wallet so that's their main point of contact so in that sense it's very similar to gcash it's very similar to paymaya um, but the difference is we are using cryptocurrency Mm -hmm. uh, as the as the currency to as a medium of exchange as a form of payment uh, specifically bitcoin cash because that's the form of bitcoin that is more tuned towards uh peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash um and also one big difference is um we we keep the private keys so what keeps your cryptocurrency secure and within your control is your possession of the private key that is used to unlock the funds that you own so in in other wallets so currently you can actually buy bitcoin cash or bitcoin in coinset ph for example and in other exchanges but the thing is they are they are putting your funds in custody they have the private key so if somebody is able to hack their systems they have the private key so they can naturally spend the funds that is your funds that's under their custody so paytaka is designed to be non-custodial meaning we are not holding the private keys in our servers when you install the app the private key is generated in the app itself it's never sent to our servers we have no way to spend your funds so it's very yeah. safe and very secure it's it's very safe it's very right. safe and, and that's and i think that's that's uh that's the kind of vision uh, if you read the the paper by satoshi nakamoto it's a peer to peer it's 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 supposed to be a peer to peer electronic system in other words you should you should give the power to the people who hold these cryptocurrencies companies like us should not hold these private keys on their behalf yes i agree i agree yeah. because otherwise we will just be just like just like a bank <laughs> which satoshi nakamoto was supposedly uh, about to replace with his new system yes i i agree sir jomar no even i myself i'm, I'm also teaching um cryptography and that's part of our um, discussions no and I would totally agree with you uh, um, on that notion. 
So there is also another question, Sir Jomar. I'm I'm not sure if um, you've heard of this, but maybe you maybe you have. So um, we are the the um, the one asking would like to ask if um, his name is Julius. Do you believe that FBI really recovers um, 2.3 million dollars in Bitcoin paid in the colonial pipeline ransom? Have you heard of this or? Yeah. Uh, I I think that it's possible it is accurate, um, and this this is because uh, certain wallets the the way wallets are stored. So for example, in the case of Paytaka, we are going to store your private key in your phone, and in some wallets they store it on the in your laptop, and technically anybody who can get hold of your private key, they can spend your funds. And um, wallets are designed such that they encrypt this private key uh, before they are stored in your device, in your computer. Mm -hmm. But the encryption key or the password comes from the user. So if you give it a weak password or a weak encryption key, FBI can figure out the encryption key. Mm. But notice, FBI can never figure out the private key of any address. So the weakness that was introduced in this particular case, the weakness was on the password that was set probably by the user for the encryption of the private key. So it's, you, you can say it's outside of the Bitcoin protocol already. Um, as, as with many uh, many financial hacks, the user is the weakest link. <laughs> um, yes, 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 I agree. Mm. All right, so, uh, yes, yes, Sir Jomar, you have something to add? No? Um, I just want to highlight again that um, when, when that is, because it's possible that um, the media is presenting it in such a way that um, in an angle where they say, oh, Bitcoin was hacked by the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is outside of the Bitcoin protocol. So th that has something to do with how, how private keys are stored. So you'd still be very careful about how you store your private key. And um, it's like, it's like, uh, uh somebody stole your wallet so it's 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 not it's not the fault of the central bank who printed the money it's it's your fault because you, ex, you your your wallet was probably left somewhere mm -hmm. and you're supposed to take care of it yes I, yes i i agree on that uh sir jomar so for the next question, you may or may not answer this, no, because of course this might be a trade secret that you have to keep confidential, mm. no. But someone is actually um, is actually asking if what computer language are you using for your um, application? Um, is that something you can you should refuse answering, Sir Jomar, or you can share it? To uh, it's okay. I think it's it's uh, pretty common anyway. Um, we use Python programming language. We use JavaScript mainly. So mainly those two, but we also work on, uh, we, we build some in uh, Golang. So it's the Go, it's a new language created by Google. Mm. But most, most of our systems are written in JavaScript and Python. Mm. All right, JavaScript and Python. Mm. The leading languages today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it's very common. So it's okay to answer the question. I think many many startups anyway use Python and JavaScript. Yes, I I, I agree. Mm. All right. So let's go to the personal questions, Sir Jomar. No, especially um, as regards startups, because you yourself, um, you're a startup founder, and they want to uh, learn it or take it from the expert. So here are some personal startup questions. So um, 
what can you advise um, startups who are also into fintech? Any advice or any guide for them, especially for those who are starting? Mm. Is it a harsh world out there? Um, fintech is a very highly regulated industry. I mean, finan uh, finan the financial, uh, how do you call it? The finance industry. So banking and finance. Um, that's heavily regulated. So one of the, aside from the technological challenge, like um, uh, building whatever innovation you have thought of in the first place, that can be tough depending on what is it that you are trying to build. The second hurdle is regulatory compliance. Especially if you are not into law, you will need some lawyers. Um, and um, sometimes this can be even more difficult than building the technology itself. And that's something to consider when you go into fintech. Uh, compliance with the law can be a major hurdle. So there are struggles also. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing that's unique about well, not maybe some other things like gambling is also highly regulated, but it's a. Uh, there are many other startups you can do that doesn't require a lot of compliance with regulations mm -hmm. uh, that you can just launch anytime when you're ready. Not in the case of Paytaka, because once we figure out what kind of product is it that we think is best suited to solve whatever problems we're trying to solve. Our next problem here is if we will be allowed to operate. Uh, but we've been we've been navigating that since we started. Um, although we haven't really like dived into uh, into it because the, our product is still under uh, development stage. But I anticipate that it's going to be one of the major uh, things that we need to cover. Mm. So in fintech, there is an extra layer of challenge, no? as mm. regards to compliance and to regulations. Right. But I believe, I think the Philippines is doing good in terms of fintech. Um, there's there's a study, there's a research that says that um, most of our startups here are, are fully invested into fintech. Now even we have, um, we have um, up, an upcoming um, unicorn startup that mm -hmm. is almost there already in the um, in the like of um, Gcash mm -hmm. from Mint. No, they're actually almost there. So I think um, fintech is actually a, a good deal or a good business. Mm -hmm. uh, start yes, as I mentioned earlier, actually the BSP is rather positive about the reception of cryptocurrencies, and they're supportive. They'd like to encourage technologies blockchain related or not anything that can improve the uh, experience of people in in fintech uh, in like uh, financial inclusion specifically um, so any any technology that promotes financial inclusion ease of use access um, they are actually quite uh, supportive uh, of, of those efforts so was it a struggle, Sir Jomar, to be originally coming from the biology field or was it that specifically biotechnology something and then venturing into technopreneurship? Um, my, my PhD is more into um, the interface between biology and computer science. So when I did my doctoral research in Belgium, I was mostly doing um, genomic analysis. So we analyze genomes of bacteria. And so, you know, when you sequence the DNA, it, it's just eventually you end up with a text file with letters C, C, D, D, C, A, 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 T, T. So th this is the genetic makeup of the of bacteria. So my daily job in my research work 
was to analyze what these letters mean. And these days, you don't do that manually anymore. You have to learn programming. You have to learn how to work with big data, create databases, indexing, processing, and all these things I had to learn uh, when I did my doctoral. Although I already had like a lot of interest in computers before that. But I also learned a lot from that experience that I was able to translate into any industry that requires similar sets of skills. And it just happened that while I was in Belgium, so 2009, it was the time when Satoshi Nakamoto, well, 2008, the paper was published. 2009, I was already in Belgium. And I encountered uh, this concept about Bitcoin when I was there. And I got instantly interested in it. And, and I thought about how I, how can I uh, work on something on top of this technology in order to advance it or to even build more useful things on top of it. And it just happened that I had the skills because I had to learn those skills for my PhD. And yeah, uh, the, the same skills we're using to, 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 to build the solutions we now uh, All right, so it, it's it's somewhat related. <laughs> I thought it's too yeah. far from what yeah. you do now. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going over some questions in Facebook Live, Sir Joe Marna, and we have here a couple of interesting questions. I hope you're still open for questions. Yeah. Sure. All right. So here's one from Froilan. Um, this is an interesting question. What can you say about the Elon uh, Elon Musk? A Bitcoin tweet or him somewhat possible manipulating Bitcoin uh, because recently after his tweet, Bitcoin fell. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? It's a love story. <laughs> so, and uh, hindi magtatagal yan. It's uh, people are uh, focused on because Elon Musk knows he's a celebrity and many people are following him. But blockchain revolution is bigger than Elon Musk. It will out outlive Elon Musk. And itong, itong uh, ups and downs because of his tweets, it will, it will go away. It will Eventually, people will not listen to him if he keeps doing this. All right, all right. Noted, Sir Jomar. <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> of course, I could be yeah, wrong. Just a personal, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just some personal um, opinion coming from Doctor Jomar. No? But um, Emerson in Facebook Live is um, asking for clarification if uh, Paytaka is compatible with iOS or not yet. Uh, we're working on it, but it's it's uh, it's designed to work on uh, Android and iOS, and we're also creating a browser extension so you can install it in your Chrome as an extension. Um, yeah, so we are everywhere, uh, except for uh, Huawei, but we are. I think it's anyway. Android apps can almost work in Huawei uh, app gallery. With, with with minimal modifications. So yeah, I guess we're, 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 we can say we're in all platforms eventually. All right, so there's a couple, a lot of questions here, um, Sir Jomar in Facebook Live. I'm um, asking for clarification, just like Oscar and Kinmar, if um, what is the difference of um, Paytaka with coins.ph? Yeah, um, I mentioned a bit earlier that um, the the way we're doing it in Paytaka is uh, it's we designed it so that we are not in custody of your private keys. So I, I didn't go into the details, um, but in order for you to when you buy bitcoins, for example, or Bitcoin Cash, it lives on an address with a private key with an associated private key and whoever has the private key can move the funds away from that address. And Paytaka is true to the mission of Satoshi Nakamoto, where we want to make cryptocurrency really at the control of whoever owns it. 
we don't want to hold your private keys ever because I want to get uh, a good sleep sleep at night. Um, and that's one difference with other wallets, including Coinsat PH. And I I heard that Globe will be will, uh, go, Globe Gcash will also go into cryptocurrencies. Mm. And PayPal already you can already receive uh, cryptocurrencies in PayPal. But these other wallets are uh, custodial, so they they actually hold your private keys on your behalf. Mm. So there is a motto in the cryptocurrency world that if it's not your private key, it's not your coin. So we 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 respect that, and and we want that if we ever build a solution to make cryptocurrency available to everyone everywhere we will we will design it in such a way that will never hold your private keys that's a good uh, that's a good one there sir joe Martin. especially we have um a new term um crypto jacking mm, interesting that that's is about. happening <laughs> so it's like um mining <laughs> crypto um, currencies in in private computers so that's actually a new um, a new term that has um, that has been born because of um, cryptocurrency but going back to our personal questions about startups uh, sir jomar um here's a good question coming from francis back in youtube live uh, youtube live no um what are the biggest lessons you've learned as a startup founder? Uh, biggest lessons I've learned as a startup founder. Um, okay. There are many, actually. I, I can just uh, cite a few. Um, when you are working on a startup idea, you are essentially trying to change something in the way the world works. So startup is big. You you are trying to make a dent in the world, in the universe. So it's, it's no joke to venture into building your own startup. It might be cool, like, oh, wow, you are working on startups. But um, especially if you work from the Philippines, um, there's a lot less opportunity, a lot less network uh, that can that you can leverage. But it's a huge challenge uh, in every in every step of the way. Uh, but um, for a highly motivated person, highly positive person, these things become. Uh, maybe stumbling blocks to others, but for you, they become like an uh, opportunity for learning. Correct. And it, it, be, yes. it becomes exciting. Like, oh, you, I passed this stage. You, you know better now than before. It's like you're climbing a very steep mountain. And after every few meters, you, you see a lot more than a few meters down. Mm, yeah, it's... Uh, it's that kind of journey. I don't know how to describe it exactly. <laughs> Those are actually nice uh, words of wisdom coming from you, no, Sir Jomar. So, can you advise, or what, what can you advise um, startups who are on the verge of giving up? You know, especially that we know that startup success doesn't happen overnight. Hmm. Actually, I would say you have to give up many things. Um, part of the learning process when you do startups is learn when to give up. So there are many things you're working on. So when, you, when you're working on a startup, you have a grand vision. Um, you are driven by a vision. But the details of it, there, there are so many ways to, as they say, there's many ways to kill a cat. Sorry for the violence, but uh, uh, you know, you know the idea. Uh, when you have a grand vision for your startup, there are many ways to tackle it, and many of those strategies won't work. And you will see it. You will learn. 
you will learn that it won't work sometimes the hard way and you should know how to give up so this strategy doesn't work give it up work on something else work on another strategy although that that doesn't mean that you should easily give up but then you should be guided by data by whatever you find out in your you, you are essentially doing micro experiments of different strategies you can explore in order to get to your vision so some of those micro strategies won't work and it's okay to give to give them up try something else um, work on a product that will achieve your vision and if that doesn't work out uh, your your potential customers don't like it give it up work on something else or maybe improve on it uh, so if you are on the verge of giving up as long as you're not giving up on your vision which is why you are doing startups in the first place you you should learn to give up on your micro strategies but definitely whatever vision you have for your startup um, I, I, I guess you will just go far enough if you believe in that vision in the first place. And if it is on your vision that you're giving up, that's, that's also, that at some context, it might also be beneficial for you because, you know, um, we only live once. <laughs> it's a short life. And so if you think uh, that vision does not align anymore with you, with your inner self, it's it's become more of a waste of your time uh you should learn when to give up as well all right that's noted uh dr joe marno especially for our budding um startups so how i think we are down to our last two questions uh sir joe mar um how is competition in startups is is it um, natural to have competitions in startups um, it's healthy, I would say. If um, if you go into uh, a certain industry where it's very competitive, um, it's very easy to lose sight uh, where the important things are. Like how how can you stay at the edge of your of the competition? Um, but these are things that you need to always update yourself with uh, where your competitors are what are they doing you go back to your drawing board and see uh, what what I what I wanted to achieve what are my unique uh, value propositions you always have to go back and see if you're still competitive or you're still driving towards uh, working towards an edge over your competitors um, if you don't have that and you happen to be in a very competitive space, you will be like left behind. And um, it's also not good to work on something that doesn't have competition at all. Um, it can work to your advantage in terms of learning new things. So you'll be there's if there's more pressure, it's it's better as long as it's still healthy for you. Because the more you are pressured to do something because you see your competitors are also performing well, you'll be pushed to do something that's uh, better than what others are doing. Yes, I would agree, Sir Joe Marno, to have um, a healthy competition because it, I think it opens up um, improvement diba? on your part. How will you improve your um, product or service as compared to the others? How will you attract more market? Diba? Um, to uh, you know how do how do you entice people to choose your product or service so it opens up improvement all right so um yeah uh, when can we say that a startup has already succeeded sir jomar how do, how do we um how do we say na this startup has already succeeded do we have some factors to consider um how do we measure success yes go ahead go ahead Sergio. Um, well there are many ways to measure success uh like operational definitions like uh your you define that you your startup is successful when you have 100 uh, like 100 million users for example 
that that can be a metric to measure your success. It could also be in terms of revenue, like you are, your startup is earning um, 100 million a year. Mm -hmm. So that could, that can be your measure. Or at different stages of your startup, you set yourself some measures of uh, of of like success in in each step. Um, because it's it's very hard to like project how your startup will perform in in five years from now. That's that's very uncertain. You'd rather define certain milestones, short term milestones, and assign very specific uh, metrics. Uh, but if you are talking about like overall, so for example, for Paytaka, when do I say that Paytaka is successful overall in terms of its vision? Uh, although we are setting like smaller goals, but if you're talking about the grand scale of things, when I see that cryptocurrency, be it Bitcoin Cash or whatever else that whatever it is that we end up using in the end, I I will say that Paytaka succeeded if cryptocurrency using our app is being used in every shop, everywhere to pay for products and services. All right. So we actually have a good um, comment from Marty in YouTube Live, uh, Sir Joe Marno, that you have to set your goal first uh, to establish a startup. So I would also agree. No, um, why? Why do you? Why do you establish a startup? Do you intend to um, earn money, or is it you? Uh, you want to um, help the community? No. To elevate um, the status of, of the community, I think uh, setting uh, the goals um, is really important when you establish mm. a start. I, I'd rather call that vision. Like so, a, a vision is for me like more than a goal. So when you when you say you have a vision, that's why you go into a startup because you have a certain vision of what the future will be. It your vision encompasses your desire and your goals and and your projections about what the future will be um, so it's something deeper than just a goal i would say you you have a certain vision for example for example let's say elon musk he has this vision that someday humans will be in mars we will live in mars so there might be some very specific goals he might have but it's it's really the vision that drives him to to achieve certain goals mm -hmm. all right noted sir joe Mar so uh one last question from nico in youtube uh, sir joe marino because i find this interesting because <laughs> we actually discussed this uh, in our first episode you no know, last um, last week do you have a co-founder in paytaka or are you the hacker, hipster, or hustler on your startup? Can you can you tell us um, a history of your uh, startup, Sir Jomar? At least to inspire no, our other participants who are listening. Okay. Um, to be honest, the idea about Paytaka, uh, it was a light bulb moment when I was in the bathroom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. CR talks. So, yeah, like uh, the, that space of creativity, of calmness when you are, you know, doing your thing. And those are one of my creative moments. And uh, those times I realized, um, why can't we... At that time, the idea about it was very different from what it is now. But the idea was, uh, why can't we create a cryptocurrency equivalent of Philippine pesos? And I was thinking about the pros and cons at that time and whether other people have done it already. And I did more, I, I became more interested to, to delve deep into how the blockchains work. And then it, it became so interesting. And I told my friends about it. And, and they are my partners now. Uh, there, there are five of us. Who, who gathered and brainstormed on on creating this, starting this project and starting a company. Um, I am the 
the programmer, the technical, uh, I do the technical side of things, uh, like the actual building. But the, in terms of discussions about blockchain and its implications on on payments and it's it's a shared effort but what i especially lack is on the marketing side so we have uh, a marketing guy on the team a very capable one and uh, we have a uh, uh, legal and accounting person in the team as well and some technical guy and PR guy, so it's the idea is that you cannot, because startups, as I have said, they, they try to do something big. That's, that's essentially the definition of startup. You are doing something, a, a business model that's very scalable, and then something really new uh, in terms of the business model. So it's it's... It is very rare that you can pull pull this pull this off on your own. You really need a team to to accomplish what uh, your goals are for the startup. It's not just for Paytaka, but for every startup. It's always a good idea to assemble a team because you can never do everything yourself. Mm, yeah, I agree. Even in our um, previous speaker, if I may share, uh, Sir Joe Marno, he shared that. Um, he started it first or alone, but eventually he needed um, co-founders, he needed partners to help him because he couldn't be able to, you know, to do it all by himself. You really have to have partners. And also, if I may add, um, if you go, so let's say you started, you, you, you worked on your startup, you have your initial customers and you want to raise funding. Investors who will look into your portfolio or the background of the company, they will be looking for a team because mm -hmm. it's almost impossible that you can do this on your own. And if you come like you, you'd say, oh, I, I do this on your own, they, they would be doubtful <laughs> because this, this really uh, takes like more than one person to, to execute. Yeah, you can do it all alone. Be the master of all. <laughs> all right. So, um, do we have questions from Miss Claire and Mike? Do you have some questions? So far, wala man, Josh. Thank you. All Very right. informative. Yes, I agree. Very informative. We have a bucket full of learning again this uh, for this afternoon session. We I think we also have no questions anymore from our YouTube and Facebook. And so with that, um, Sir Jomar, allow us to give um, and present a simple token uh, of our gratitude uh, for you. So this um, certificate of appreciation is given to Dr. Jomar Tagana of Paytaka for sharing his time, talent, and expertise as the resource speaker during the 2021 Startup Thursdays number two um, on blockchain, cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptocurrencies and decentralized commerce webinar conducted by DICT Visayas Cluster 2 held and given um, today, um, the 10th day of June 2021. So this is to be signed by our um, OIC, Office of the Regional Director of DICT Visayas Cluster 2, Mr. Frederick D.C. Amora. So thank you very much, uh, you. Sir Jomar. Do you have some final words um, to our participants, to our listeners? Um, no, I think I've said enough. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sir Jomar. I hope we can still um, invite you in the future <laughs> because we really, every time that we invite you, you know, you really deliver a lot of um, inputs and you really inspire the listeners. And I'm looking forward to our next session on Ta Apohon or someday. Sure. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Jomar. Dr. Thank Jomar. You. All right, so um, before we give to you, for those who are waiting for the COTD or our code of the, of the day, no, we still haven't um, shown or displayed the COTD. But allow me first to um, recognize our um, very special people who made 
this event successful. Of course, to our speaker, Mr. Joe Martagana, our Suki na speaker. This is our second time inviting him to speak to our webinar. Um, to our OIC Office of the Regional Director, uh, Mr. Frederick Amores, for his utmost, utmost support no? in, um, in supporting our Startup Thursdays webinar. To Silliman University Technolo Technology Business Innovation or Synergy uh, Group. No? Um, to DICT, IIDB, and ISCD in the central office for helping us, uh, for supporting us in our endeavor and for helping us market our um, webinar for the whole month of June. Of course, to Ms. Claire Fernandez, our ever beautiful and supportive IIDB focal of Visayas Cluster 2, who amid her busyness, no, who she gave um, her time um, to open and welcome us this afternoon. To Mike, of course, to George Michael Picardal, who is our person behind our live stream this afternoon, as always. Mike, we still have two more uh, live streams to do. <laughs> and of course, this, this has been Joshua Elizardo, and your moderator for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Of course, also to our participants, we have, I think, almost 60 right now in YouTube Live, while 100 plus, 130 something in Facebook. So thank you for um, participating. So we still have, as, 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 what, I've, as what we've been saying you guys, we still, this is a month long um, Startup Thursdays webinar, every Thursday at 1.30. So we still have um, two sets of speakers um next week on june 17 is the fruits of stubbornness um, um topic by our startup co-founders no and they are still students our speakers next week are still students from Silliman university so um this is also interesting no um how they were able to establish a startup even if they're still students no, unlike our recent speakers who are already established, who are already graduates. No? Um, but next week, um, it will be about students who are able to establish and launch a startup. So that will be next week. And for the last week, we have the whys of startups, solving real life problems. I think this is also a friend of um, Sir Joe Mar, no? Mr. Nel Laigo of Peddler. So that will be his topic. I hope you can still join us in the next two um, Thursdays of June. So if you have already registered, there's no need for you to register again. We will use the same link um, uh, for you to watch and listen no? both in our um, Facebook and YouTube live. All right. So you can share to your friends, to your relatives, to your colleagues, to your fellow teachers that we still have two remaining Startup Thursdays episodes in the next Thursdays to come. So I know you've been waiting for this. This is our code of the day. So you can take a screenshot of that. You can, um, um, you can take note of that, no? Once again, you need this code in your um, or in, in our evaluation form, there's a field there or there is a part there that you have to input the code of the day. So reminder lang, our code of the day is key sensitive, meaning to say if there is um, capital letters there or if that is all lowercase, then you must have to input it as is. All right, so that is our code of the day. All right, and finally, this is our evaluation form or link. No, you can, if you have your mobile phones there or your devices there, you can just scan our QR code. And another reminder, the link closes after 30 minutes. All right, so at four o'clock, we will be closing our evaluation form. All right, so with that, um, we thank you once again to our Suki participants. 
I hope we still see each other uh, next Thursday. In the next Thursdays to come, we still have two remaining um, Startup Thursdays webinar episodes. Right? So thank you very much on behalf of Ms. Claire and, my, and Mike from IIDB. We thank you for supporting and watching our live stream today. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sir Jomar. Thank you, Sir Jomar.